Hercules. It had four powerful turboprop engines and a fat fuselage with the greatest possible internal capacity for its size. It entered service in 1956. The development of Soviet transport aircraft had fallen behind the West. In 1956, the best Soviet transport was the twin-engine crate. Nikita Khrushchev encouraged the development of new Soviet transports, but it was almost four years before Soviet military transport aviation answered the C-130. The new aircraft was from the Antonov Bureau. It had high wings and four turboprops. It looked remarkably like the Hercules. The AN-12 was codenamed Cub by NATO. Its configuration, size, and mission all coincided closely with C-130, but in some ways it was cruder. The C-130 was completely pressurized and air-conditioned. The AN-12's cargo hold was not. The original engines of the C-130, at four and a half thousand horsepower each, were slightly more powerful than those of the AN-12. The wingspan of the Hercules was 132 feet, eight feet greater than the AN-12. But the AN-12 was about eight feet longer. The AN-12 was significantly faster than the Hercules, capable of more than 480 miles an hour. But the Hercules had a greater range with its maximum payload. For a transport aircraft, the most important statistic is payload. And here the Hercules was a clear winner. Its maximum takeoff weight of 175,000 pounds was about 40,000 pounds greater than the AN-12. The AN-12 was not a new design. It was a development of the Antonov AN-10A, a commercial transport that had considerable teething troubles. In 1959, design conferences were held to improve its performance and adapt it for military use. The wingspan was reduced to give extra speed, and the fuselage was lengthened to increase cargo and fuel capacity. A defensive gun position was added to the tail, and the large rear door was fitted. The result was the AN-12. It could carry 44,000 pounds of useful load, or 80 to 100 fully armed troops. It could operate from poor airfields, and it could be fitted with skis for use in snow. At last, the post-war Soviet Union had a competitive transport aircraft. The AN-12 came just at the right time. In the early 60s, a new doctrine of air mobility was added to Soviet military thinking. It involved a variety of concepts, from air mobility in nuclear war to air transport support of deep offensive operations. Although the emphasis of Soviet military thought in the 60s was on nuclear war, the possibility of conventional conflict was not ignored. Throughout the 60s, paratroops dropped from Soviet transport aircraft were a feature of Soviet military exercises. In March 1970, in a military exercise called Dvina, 8,000 paratroops and 160 combat vehicles were unloaded in 22 minutes, most of them from AN-12 Cubs. The Cub has been used for a variety of tasks in addition to its straight cargo or troop carrying role. This one is being used at the Zhukovsky Institute outside Moscow to test ejection seat systems. <laughs> 
Less unusual variants of the Cub have included two different versions adapted for electronic intelligence, some in service with Soviet naval aviation. There's also an electronic countermeasures version designed to fly in orbit just inside Soviet borders. It carries equipment to jam the radars of NATO Hawk missile batteries. The adaptation to test ejection seats is one of the more unusual variations of the basic Cub. Although the AN-12 was a breakthrough for Soviet military transport, from a world point of view, it was not particularly significant. But the next Soviet military transport was. When it was introduced in 1965, it was the largest aircraft in existence. It came from the Antonov Bureau and was called the AN-22. NATO gave it the code name Kok, but its Soviet nickname was Antheus. The name was an unfortunate choice, because in Greek mythology, the wrestler Antheus was invincible so long as he had one foot in contact with his mother, the Earth. Like its namesake, the Antonov AN-22 Antheus was more impressive when it remained in contact with the Earth than when it was in the air. The Antheus was designed to carry the largest of the Soviet fighting vehicles, including the T-62, T-72, and T-80 battle tanks and SAM missile launchers. Originally, there was great hope for its development as a military transport and as a civil airliner capable of carrying more than 700 passengers. A production run of about 30 aircraft a year was planned, but by the time production was halted in 1974, only 75 had been built. Like the AN-12 Cub, the AN-22 was in some ways crude. Pressurization was restricted to the flight deck and forward cabin, which could hold about 28 passengers. But it had enormous load capacity. The floor of the cargo hold was reinforced titanium, which allowed it to support the weight of the giant tanks it was designed to carry. It had a combination door and ramp which opened to the rear, two winches and four traveling gantries. Span of this giant turboprop aircraft was 211 feet. It had a top speed of 460 miles an hour and it could lift 180,000 pounds of freight. In one record attempt, it lifted 100 metric tons, about 220,000 pounds, to a height of 25,000 feet. But in spite of its success as a record breaker, the AN-22 was a disappointing aircraft in service. The Antonov Bureau would have to wait some years before it could establish genuine preeminence as a designer of giant aircraft. In the late 60s, the Aleutian Design Bureau was given the task of designing a transport aircraft with four turbofan engines. It was to be in the same class as the US Air Force's C-141A Starlifter. The result was the IL-76, codenamed Candid by NATO. The prototype flew for the first time in March 1971. It was similar in appearance to the Starlifter, but a bit larger overall. Its wingspan was 165 feet and its length 153. It was a big aircraft, but by no means a giant. One of the briefs of the IL-76 was that it should replace the turbo-powered AN-12 Cub. Its designers were required to produce an aircraft 
that can carry almost 90,000 pounds of freight, a distance of 3,100 miles in less than six hours. All this had to be achievable in the harshest conditions of a Siberian winter. It was a versatile aircraft. This version is able to carry and drop large quantities of fire retardant. In July 1975, the IL-76 established 25 official payload to height and payload at speed records. NATO identified five different versions of the basic IL-76. There is also an airborne early warning and control version known by NATO as mainstay. Another major variant of the IL-76 was the result of 10 years of development from the mid-70s to the mid-80s. It is the in-flight refueling version known to NATO as MIDAS. This MIDAS is refueling a group of Suhoi 27s, present-day Russia's premier frontline fighter. Soviet practice was always to use its aircraft as flexibly as possible. This IL-76 is performing extremely low-level cargo drop test runs. In 1967, just after the Arab-Israeli War, an article in the London Economist was headed, Bears Can't Fly. It suggested that the reason the Soviet Union had not intervened on the Arab side was lack of strategic mobility. It suggested that the same problem affected any Soviet military action outside the Eurasian land mass, and that the Soviet Union was incapable of using small mobile forces to further its policies in remoter parts of the world. The article went on to say that if the Soviet Union attempted to solve this problem by improving its ability to move troops by air, it would be a bad omen for East-West relations. In fact, the Soviet Union was already moving in that direction. It had already negotiated permission to overfly Yugoslavia, and very shortly after the Arab-Israeli war was busy carrying arms and equipment to the defeated Arab states via Yugoslavia and Iraq. By the time the 1973 Arab-Israeli conflict broke out, the Soviet Union was in a position to offer far greater air transport assistance than had been the case in 1967. In October 1973, Soviet military transport aviation made over a thousand resupply flights to Cairo and Damascus. U.S. President Nixon was concerned that the Soviet Union would airlift some of its airborne divisions to intervene directly in the fighting. Nixon declared a Defense Condition 3 alert and placed the U.S. 82nd Airborne Division on an advanced state of readiness. Soviet military transport had come a long way in just six years. As IL-76s began to replace the AN-12 Cub, it improved even more. By the second half of the 70s, Soviet military transport aviation and Aeroflot were able to reach deep into Africa and Asia, supplying arms, equipment and troops. The use of Aeroflot aircraft, which appeared to be civilian, allowed the Soviet Union to avoid overt infringement of neutral airspace. In December 1979, 5,000 Soviet airborne troops were airlifted into the Afghan capital, Kabul. These troops assisted in overthrowing the Afghan regime and replacing it with a pro-Soviet group. By 1981, it was clear that the Soviet Union held an advantage in any race with the U.S. to intervene in a military situation in the Eurasian landmass. In 
In Soviet eyes, the situation recalled the glory days of the 1930s, when Soviet TB3s could overwhelm enemy positions by dropping their large loads of paratroops into the heart of the action. An estimate in the early 80s was that it would take six days for the US to get a marine amphibious brigade of 16,500 troops to the Persian Gulf. At the same time, the Soviet Union, using Soviet military transport aviation and aeroflot, could have 20,000 troops on the ground there in two days. In those circumstances, the comparative crudity of Soviet transport aircraft became an advantage. They were generally more capable of landing on primitive airfields. Their onboard cargo handling equipment made them very self-contained. They had auxiliary power units for takeoff from poorly equipped airfields. They often carried their own ground engineers to solve any problems that might arise in the field. Outside Eurasia, the Soviet airborne divisions of the AN-12s, AN-22s, and IL-76s had their shortcomings, and America compared better. Soviet military exercises were impressive, but there was a problem with the aircraft that delivered tanks and troops to the battlefield. Production of the giant AN-22 had finished in 1974, and it had not been replaced. The smaller IL-76 was the only Soviet jet-powered heavy transport aircraft. In 1980, the first flight of a jet-powered Russian giant, capable of delivering battle tanks and troops in great numbers, was still two years away. Return in a moment to Weekday Wings on the Discovery Channel. In 1968, the Lockheed C-5A Galaxy took the title of the world's largest aircraft from the Antonov Anthus. The Galaxy's wingspan was 222 feet. Its maximum takeoff weight, almost 770,000 pounds, was more than 200,000 pounds greater than the Russian giant. It was much faster, and its range was greater. It was unchallenged as the world's largest aircraft for 14 years. The performance of the AN-22 Antheus was disappointing to the Soviet authorities. Its production run was cut short in 1974, and development began on a successor, a jet-powered aircraft, larger still than the Lockheed Galaxy. The prototype did not fly until December 1982, but when it eventually took to the air, it assumed the title of the world's largest aircraft. It was designed by the Antonov Bureau, building on what Antonov had learned from the Anthus. It also benefited from American experience with the Galaxy. The fact that the Soviet Union was able to build an aircraft of this size, that was more than just a showpiece, came as something of a surprise to the West. In the early 80s, Western authorities were not sure of the state of large jet engine development in the Soviet Union. They didn't know whether Soviet turbofan engines were comparable with those of the West in power and fuel economy. This vast aircraft dispelled any doubts. Its four giant Lotharev turbofans produced more than 50,000 pounds of thrust each. They made it a very effective performer in the air. On July the 26th, 1985, an AN-124 set 21 official world records. It lifted a payload of more than 377,000 pounds to a height of 35,000 feet. This was 53% greater than the previous record which had been set by the galaxy. 
The first AN-124 seen in the West appeared at the Paris Air Show in 1985. It was named the Ruslan, after the giant Russian hero immortalized by Pushkin. Soviet designers have been very sensitive about the code names applied to their aircraft by NATO. And at times, some NATO names that were considered by the West to be too flattering were changed. They were replaced with something that more accurately reflected the degree of bitterness existing in East-West relations at the time. But in the case of the AN-124, NATO made an appropriate and even generous choice. They named it the Condor, after the world's largest flying bird. The Condor is similar in appearance to the Lockheed Galaxy. The major difference is that the Galaxy has a T-tail arrangement with the tail plane mounted high on top of the fin. And in the Condor, the tail is mounted low on the rear fuselage. The Condor is a great leap in size past the galaxy. Its wingspan, 240 feet, is almost 20 feet greater. Its maximum takeoff weight exceeds the galaxy by more than 100,000 pounds. But it's not as fast as the galaxy, and its range carrying maximum payload is shorter. Soviet accounts of the development of the Condor say that it was relatively trouble-free. Once it entered service, there was little need to make significant changes either to the structure or the subsystems of the aircraft. By 1986, there were five in service. They were being used principally for heavy lift work in Siberia. On one flight, a Condor carried an 80 metric ton turbine into Central Asia. It had to be loaded with a specially built cradle. The Condor started making international air show appearances in 1985 in Paris. In 1986, it made a non-stop 12-hour flight from Moscow to Abbotsford in British Columbia for an air show there. This aircraft is landing at Farnborough in 1988. One of the great challenges in an aircraft of this size is the design of landing gear and brakes. The Condor's braking system includes protection against overheating that could lead to tire burst. Small airfoils are placed inside the wheel hubs to draw in cooling air during the aircraft's ground roll. The Condor was developed in the days before Perestroika, but even so, Help with the design of the landing gear and braking system was sought in the West. Antonov tried to arrange meetings with the European landing gear and brake manufacturer to ask for information about their carbon brakes. The requests were rejected. In the end, the landing gear was a major achievement. There are 24 wheels, and the system is designed so that the aircraft can operate from a variety of substandard surfaces. These include unprepared airfields, hard-packed snow, and ice-covered swampland. But it must take great courage to land an aircraft as heavy as this on ice. We will return in a moment to Weekday Wings on the Discovery Channel. In 1989, the Soviet Union began to offer the AN-124 for charter to international customers who needed access to an aircraft with unusually large lift capacity. This AN-124 is landing in Hamburg, Germany, for a very special mission. 
It has been hired to carry a 50-year-old aircraft, the Junkers Ju-52, to the United States for a 10-month goodwill tour. The tour is sponsored by the German airline Lufthansa. The Junkers 52 has been disassembled and packed into a large container, ready for loading into the vast cargo hold of the Condor. The main hold is cavernous. It's 118 feet long and 21 feet wide. The whole of this area is floored with titanium to give the strength necessary to support the immense loads it's designed to accommodate. The structure of the hold also uses a large amount of composite material, which gives great strength with less weight than metals. The Condor has two enormous openings for access, one at the nose and one under the rear of the fuselage. The rear opening is a combination door and ramp. The aircraft can be loaded from the front and the rear at the same time. It has a crew of seven, with accommodation for reserve crew for long flights. When the Soviet Union offered the Condor for international charter work in 1989, the Antonov Bureau felt that it had an advantage because of the aircraft's enormous load capacity and its ability to operate from surfaces of poor standard. At the time, the AN-124 was far ahead of its rivals as the largest and most powerful aircraft in the world. But Antonov were already testing a development of the AN-124 that would take the concept of giant aircraft another major step forward. The Antonov AN-225 was designed to carry immense loads either inside its vast cargo hold or mounted on top of the fuselage. One of its most important potential loads was the Soviet space shuttle, the Buran. It could be used to carry the Buran piggyback fashion in the same way Boeing 747s had been used to carry the American space shuttle for atmospheric testing and for transport to and from the launch site. The combination of the giant AN-225 and the Buran was shown to the Western world for the first time at the 1989 Paris Air Show. By that time, the first AN-225 had been test flying for six months. The Buran was mounted on the back of the AN-225 for the first time in May 1989 at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Buran was the name of the Soviet Union's first shuttle orbiter. At the time it flew to the Paris Air Show on the back of the AN-225, Soviet authorities were debating whether one or two further shuttle orbiters would be built. The Buran made the Soviet Union's first unmanned shuttle test mission in November 1988. Originally, before the AN-225 became available, it was transported on the back of a converted Myashishchev M4 bomber. We now return to Weekday Wings on the Discovery Channel. In August 1989, an AN-225 landed at Elmendorf Air Force Base in Alaska. It was on its way with two MiG-29 fighters to the Abbotsford Air Show in Canada. The refueling stop at Elmendorf was the first visit either Soviet aircraft had made to North America. The evolution of this Soviet giant was extraordinary. It flew for the first time just six years after the prototype of its predecessor, the AN-124. Actual development time was three and a half years from the start of work to the prototype's first flight. The speed of its development was only possible because it was based completely on the AN-124. 
but even though the basic design components were the same, it is a very different aircraft, much bigger, with far greater load capacity. The AN-225's Russian name is Mryat, the dream, and by Western standards, it is just that, almost impossibly larger than the largest Western transport aircraft. The AN-225 has the same engines as the AN-124, Lotarev D-18s, but it has six of them instead of four. To accommodate the extra two engines, a new central section adding almost 50 feet to the wingspan was incorporated into the center of the wing. This means that the wingspan of the Dream is 290 feet. Apart from the new central section, the wings are identical to those of the AN-124. The AN-225's maximum takeoff weight is more than 25% greater than any previous aircraft. It is 600 metric tons, about 1,300,000 pounds. 250 tons of this is payload. It's 100 tons greater than the payload the AN-124 could carry, and it's about twice as much as the Lockheed C-5 Galaxy. The nose gear has two side-by-side -side twin wheel units. They can kneel, allowing the nose to drop close to the ground for loading. The main landing gear each have seven sets of two wheels, 28 wheels in all. This gives such a load-bearing spread that the AN-225, in spite of its immense bulk, can operate from unprepared fields. The front cargo doors of the 225 operate in the same way as the 124, but there is no rear door underneath the fuselage. To compensate, the 225 has the extra flexibility of being able to carry large external loads. The flight deck is almost identical to the AN-124 with accommodation for a crew of seven. The fuselage was lengthened 23 feet by adding two additions fore and aft of the wing. Almost all this new length is included in the cargo bay, which is 141 feet long. The AN-225 needs 11,500 feet of runway to take off. With a full internal payload, it has a range of 2,800 miles. It is alone in the world of aviation inside. It dwarfs its antecedent, the AN-124, which in turn dwarfed other large aircraft like the C-5 and the Boeing 747. The Antonov Design Bureau has made extraordinary progress. Oleg Antonov's vision of quality in Soviet transport aircraft began with the modest AN-2 biplane in 1947. Within 40 years, his bureau has designed the world's two largest aircraft. With the introduction of the Condor and six years later the Dream, Antonov had dragged the Soviet Union back to the top of the world's producers of large aircraft, a position it had not held since the early 1930s. The appearance of the dream coincided with perestroika and the beginning of the end for the Soviet Union. The AN-124 and 225 are no longer protected by artificialities of the Soviet economy. They are now fighting with the heavyweights of the capitalist system for a continuing place in world aviation. Whether they make it or not is for history to decide. But at the moment, there is nothing on the aerospace horizon to match the two splendid Russian giants.
up, break through the brush.